Welcome to another edition of the SprintCarLimited.com Deep Dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. Joining us on the show this week is announcer and marketing guru, Brian Holbert, who discusses his rise in the sport, his tenure with ASCS, his move to USAC, and much more in this in-depth interview. Before we get to Brian, don't forget to check out Entrust IT Solutions. Entrust is a full-service technology company serving small and mid-sized businesses in New York, Pennsylvania, and surrounding areas. The staff at Entrust takes a personalized approach to technology. See why customers are choosing Entrust IT Solutions as our technology partner by scheduling a free consultation at www.entrust-msp.com or calling 717-292-8868. Brian, welcome to the deep dive. Oh, thanks for having me on. No problem. I, I'm liking the beard. I'm liking the beard. Fear the beard. <laughs> it's, it's it's become a staple. It's <laughs> it, it it does a couple things. One, great insulation. Two, it hides the fact that I was born without a chin, and I made up for it with extra chins. <laughs> I'm on, I'm in the second boat. So. <laughs> and what you've shaved that twice in 15 years? You were telling me off air uh, about. It, 10 to 15 years. I think the last time I actually was down to where you could see my face was 2000, probably 12, 13, somewhere in there. And it was actually by mistake. I was going to just trim, trim my beard and I didn't get the guard on all the way. So ended up taking Oops. it down to stubble. And I'd been with my wife at the time for maybe three months. And I, I video called her so she could see and she's like oh well, I don't know well then I got home and I was sitting on the couch with her and she goes you need to grow it back and I said <laughs> do, I, do I do I look that bad or what she goes no she's a music teacher and she was teaching high school at the time she goes I feel like I'm dating one of my students she <laughs> goes, I, I, I just can't do it I can't do it <laughs> so the, the the beard had to stay the only other time I I had shaved it off was intentional my son was two and he'd never seen me without facial hair and the reaction was glorious. <laughs> Only you would do it as a goof. Well, I mean, I'll, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna get blamed for blamed for the therapy sessions when he gets older, anyway. So I might as well give him a reason. There you go. <laughs> Speaking of therapy, you're in motorsports. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're. We're, I, I go back to Royal Jones, who who got me started in all this. He was the first promoter to hire me. And he said one day we're all here because we're not all there. And I've, I've pretty much seen that that is 100% correct. Well, you've certainly done it all in um, dirt track racing. I, I think uh, talking to you, you've worked probably every job at a track. You People mostly know you as an announcer, you know, for ASCS, the, the Chili Bowl, obviously, which I'm sure – Maybe you'll try and convert me in during this interview. I, I doubt that that'll happen, but no, <laughs> but <laughs> there'll be some subliminal messages. Or is it, we're going to be walking around here, you know, going by the end of this screaming, one of us, one of us. <laughs> no, I, I don't, I don't know about that. How, how many movie busts are going to know where that came from? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you're how old now? Uh, 38. How did you get started in motorsports? Let's start at the beginning. How did you get involved your first Fourier in the motorsports? I started as a fan. Uh, my family would go to the races. And then in 1993, my dad and my brothers actually started racing a hobby stock. And that kind of progressed from there. We got into sprint car racing in 1996, 97. And we did sprint cars all the way. Uh, we, we took a break after 2002. We went and raced on the road and <laughs> found out how expensive racing really is and got back into it a few years later. And we actually sold everything in the end of 2010. And in that time, I went from just casual fan to working on the cars, building the cars, owning the cars. And when I was in college, I was getting my degree in marketing. So it kind of started as a joke. In fact, it did start as a joke. Holly Jones was the 
manager of Southern New Mexico Speedway at the time, and she was trying to pit report. And either the mic wasn't working or the radio wasn't working, but either way, she she couldn't get a hold of the tower to get this interview done. And I jokingly looked there and said, "All oh, hell, give me the mic." Well, she took me seriously. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at Holly going, you know me way too long. Like we went to school together and I'm going, I don't have a filter. Like you don't give me an open microphone. And she goes, no, like, well, will you try it? I'm like, no, okay. I mean, and th- it's something that had always been in the back of my mind is I wanted to, to be a commentator and, and work in motorsports because I knew I wasn't going to be a driver. I had made that promise to my mom and my dad years ago that I is long as they're around, I will not get in a race car. And and there's more to that, but it's neither here nor there at this point. So the the next week I I started as a pit reporter for Southern New Mexico and that turned into also doing trackside for El Paso Speedway Park. And that was in 2006. In 2007, about midway through the season, the announcer at the time uh, quit and I took over as a master of ceremonies on 76 and 7707. I love the term master of ceremonies. We don't have that title enough in dirt track racing. Well, it's either that or King of the Rednecks. <laughs> well, and you know, as you don't have a filter, I usually don't have a filter asking questions. Why didn't you become a driver? I got to ask what, what was the promise was, was, was somebody in your family injured? I mean, you don't have to go in too depth, too deep if you don't want to, but why not a driver? My mom's first husband was killed in a sprint car. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense then. So my dad was there that night, witnessed everything. Of course, my mom was there and it was just better that I didn't. And kind of going back to that, when I was, you know, a teenager, I, it, it frustrated me a little bit because I didn't understand at the time because my brothers raced hobby stocks with my dad and I'm going, you know, man, well, they raced, you know, why couldn't I? And, and he explained it to me and, and I understood But looking back now, when we got out of racing with what my dad had told me at the time, I, I asked him if you could change all of this, you know, we, we went through a lot of financial hardships. We went through a lot of struggle. Would you change it? And he said, absolutely not. He said, you have to look at it this way. I'm not bailing you guys out of jail. I'm not paying lawyers fees. I'm not paying child support for kids that you have all over the city. I knew where you were at. I knew you were safe. And we did something together as a family that I couldn't put a price on. He goes, you cannot put a price on peace of mind. So yes, I would 100% do it again. And as my dad put it, I could probably break a ball bearing with a rubber hammer. So it's a good idea that I didn't get in a race car. Well, and look what it's (laughs) turned into. I mean, this is your career. Well, he told me, he goes, you can do anything you want. He goes, you can do anything you want in racing. Just don't get in a race car. So the announcing, I I feel like I'm kind of jumping around the timeline a lot here, but the announcing actually started by listening to a gentleman named Alan Moore, who was the announcer whenever I was growing up. And Alan is an interesting story, too, because he did not have the use of his legs. He had contracted polio as a child, so he was on crutches his entire life nearly. But he had an incredible voice. I say had. He has an incredible voice. He's worked in radio. He's worked as a commentator. And he was my inspiration growing up. And he was one of those that could make flies buzzing around a windowsill sound exciting. So that that's where my inspiration came from originally was, was listening to him. Well, you're one of the best announcers in the country. I've listened to many. I think you're very underrated. And no, it's not because you're on the show. I've told you this before. I think at the pit air, in the pit area at Knoxville, despite the fact that you do the Chili Bowl. And... <laughs> <laughs> and but no you actually and, and i gotta say this before i go any further you do do a good job at the chili bowl that is a great atmosphere for you inside you know building inside in front of everybody i've seen the the hype that you kind of get started so that might actually get me there someday um, um whatever we need to do i mean it's not <laughs> like i don't it's not like i don't know the guy that does the credentials yeah, that, that's true. So, Chili Bowl is interesting because the announcing is kind of a is kind of a back burner thing for me. I I I enjoy 
building the track, deconstructing the track, you know, the logistics of it, whether it's the parking, the, like that's actually more my priority than the announcing, even though I, I do the entries and I have all the sponsors in front of me and I have a lot of the information, <laughs> I feel like I'm about three steps behind Tony and, and Blake and everybody going in as an announcer because I'm, I'm so focused on everything else, but right. it, it makes it interesting. It, it gives me something to look forward to every year and it's a challenge. It probably helps with the unmedicated you know, ADHD I got going on here. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll talk about that stuff in a minute. So you, you take the mic mm -hmm. and you, you turn in the master of ceremonies, which is going to find a, a way into a story of mine at some point. Cause I just love that term. What did that all entail? When you, when you started that gig, I would assume you pretty much did everything. Yeah. I, I was covering all the classes, uh, Friday and Saturday night. And then that turned into working in the marketing side with the two tracks and selling advertising, uh, designing the program. If we had printouts, schedule printouts, anything like that, that was all stuff that I was starting to do and was nice about it is I was going to, to college at the time for a marketing degree. So I was able to take what I was learning and apply it in a real world setting. And not only that, apply it in a niche marketing setting. And this is right when integrated brand promotion was starting to really work into the lexicon where you had social media was starting to blow up. This is when Facebook and Twitter and everything was really starting to take off and, and figuring out how to utilize that as, as a racetrack. And I remember in 2011, actually posting lineups and results for the first time to the Southern New Mexico Speedway Facebook page. And at that, at that time, that was... I don't remember anybody else doing that. And I'm sure there was other tracks and sanctioning bodies doing it at the time, but I watched our social media jump from, you know, minuscule to that was our main form of marketing by the time the season was done. So, you know, I saw that going on whenever it first started. And this is when the algorithms were a lot different. It was more of a, you know, kind of a raw feel. You weren't, so much of hey well if you spend this much then then we can expose you to to more than five percent of your audience this is when everything was just absolutely raw and real in social media so it was interesting to see that evolve into what it is now and kind of follow that so i would assume your next job was ascs they came through in 2010 on a two-day show justin zock was calling the sprint cars i was calling the modifieds and if it wasn't for the race that Stormy and Johnny Scott, along with Tommy Meyer Jr. put on that weekend, I don't know if they would have even taken a look at me. They, those three in traffic were, were the race that weekend. I mean, I, I love sprint cars, but I also am a fan of anything that goes and nothing. So the Modifieds put on a hell of a race that weekend. And we got done with the first night. I came in on Saturday and Scott Trailer with Racing Boys, who was the broadcaster at the time, Ask me, you know, do you ever thought about doing this for a living? And I'm laughing going, that's the biggest, you know, redneck dream ever is to get paid to be a race fan, essentially. And Donna, I, I didn't really take him seriously. And then Donna came in and she asked me the same question. I'm going, why are you guys asking me this? Like, I'm, I'm nobody from nowhere. And I went ahead, got a resume and all my credentials and everything together. And I started part time. In 2011, in fact, the first race I called was in February that year at Tulare. And I, I called the broadcast, the track, not knowing the series had hired their own announcer at the time, had hired Bobby Gerald. So Bobby handled the, the PA duties and I did the broadcast. Okay. So that, I ended up doing two races in California, the two-day show in Tucson, went back. Did the whole season in El Paso and Las Cruces, and at the Devil's Bowl Winter Nationals that year, I actually got hired full-time and started with ASCS at every national event starting in 2012. At that point, what was going through your mind to get hired? Because ASCS, even at that time, I mean, there were was, there was some guys there. I mean, there you know, you had some some national names there, and it was a series that had regional racing and and obviously their national tour what's going through your mind as you're getting hired to do this 
essentially national gay. What the hell did I just get myself into? <laughs> that that was really the first thought I had because I I hadn't realized the gravity of what I was getting ready to take on until I really started taking it on. And it I mean it took a couple years to really kind of get get figured out into a rhythm and and decide that this is what I wanted to do because it's it's grueling. You know, there there's this <laughs> idea that racing on the road and and being a part of this deal is somehow glamorous and fun and and don't get me wrong it's fun but you have to be a hundred percent just infatuated with it it has to be the greatest addiction ever for you to to stay in it because i see even on my side or or on the team side one of the biggest problems they have is finding crew members that will yep stay more than a month or two and I've seen a lot of people come and go on both sides of the aisle, whether it's on the the PR and the officiating side or on the the crew member side. And once I figured out that, yeah, this is what I want to do, you know, then it it I just bared down and and just kind of went for it and really tried to to learn and hone my craft. And I'm fortunate that I met guys like Chris Steppen along the way who really helped me a lot. And he's on the late model modified side. In fact, if you watch Volusia. He was the one calling the dirt car late models and the UMP dirt car modifieds alongside right. Johnny Gibson. And then he called the the late models whenever I was there with USAC. And he's one that's been an absolutely fantastic friend and a great teacher through all this. And then Tony Bachoven's another one that when I when I first took over as the MC at those tracks, I had done track side, but I'd never really done, you know, calling a race from top side. So I went back and pulled the VHS tapes, yes, VHS tapes, from Knoxville <laughs> when we raced up there in 2000, 2001 to 2002, and I listened to Tony. So for the first couple of years of, of announcing, I was the I was the Timu version of Tony Bacco, and it was the biggest ripoff you'd ever seen in your life. <laughs> but I learned a lot from him and was able to, to communicate with him before I ever even started this. And, you know, he, he gave me a lot of pointers. Justin Zock gave me a lot of pointers. Alan Moore. Um, I was able to talk to him as my childhood announcing hero, and he gave me a lot of pointers. So, you know, people like that have have been there along the way. And then, you know, meeting like Chet and Bobby and, and all them and been able to to learn from them. And there's parts of my announcing that I if if I say certain things, it's actually nods to them. So like with Tony, his, his one of his deals is your battle is for the lead. Um, anytime I say that, that's my nod to Tony, um, the sit back, relax and enjoy when they're coming around for the green flag. That's Chris, you know, j- just little things like that, where I'm acknowledging the people that taught me along the way. Oh, that's interesting. I think so. That, bring, that brings up the question. Go ahead. And, and, and it's funny, social media there, they were kind of torn about it whenever I was doing the shows down in Florida why in the hell does lunch money have anything to do with racing? And I'll tell you where that came from. Sarah Q was the score in Las Cruces and El Paso. Now, if I had to describe Q, she's, she's about the most real gangster I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and you either knew, you either knew Q, which was, you know, she would just look at me and go, yo, be money. Or you knew Sarah, which is customer service voice. Hi, how are you? How can I help you? <laughs> So Sarah, uh, th- th- this will give you an idea of who Sarah is. She does not like sprint cars. She's a huge modified fan. Um, Ryan Gustin, one of her absolute favorite drivers, of course, Johnny and Stormy Scott, they, of course, coming from Las Cruces. She walks up to Steve Kinzer at a World of Outlaws race with Royal Jones, of course, Messiah Valley Transportation, who sponsored Steve, looks right at him and goes, I really have no idea who you are, but you got a big ass Q in the center of your wing. So I think you're dope as shit. <laughs> Th- that straight to Kinzer's face and he's laughing his ass off. And he's like, get this woman a hood. But that's Q. So they're coming around. I've got the hype music going. We're getting ready to get lined up in the into the the four wide that we're doing and get done with that. And Q looks at me and she goes, yo, be money. I've been saving, I've been saving lunch money for this shit. That's where the lunch money came from. That ah, is another okay. nod. That is my nod to Q. And the joke was, this is what you saved your lunch money for. 
and it just stuck. For announcers, and and I want to get into this because you've done it now for a, a long time, and I can't imagine how many races you've done. It's do people take for granted fans how easy they think it's easy and it's really not. I think that goes in any industry, you know, especially what people don't understand on the announcing side, you're one set of eyes watching 24 cars and you can't always call all the action all the time. And I see it all the time. Well, quit talking about the leader, you know, talk about the race for 10. Okay. Then I missed the pass for the lead. I mean, there, there's give and take in that. And I always try to like, if the leader's got a five second advantage, I'm going to try to go back through the field and talk about as many drivers right. as I can because, yeah, there is more than just a leader, and it gets old talking about, well, he's leading by three seconds, he's leading by two seconds. I want to talk about as many drivers as I can, but you always have to keep an eye on the leader, and, and sometimes it's tough to do, especially when you get on smaller tracks where they get in traffic. It's easy to lose a leader, even in a wing series. Yeah, You have to take a step back for a second and watch and figure out where they're at. It's not easy. It's not the most difficult job at the track, but it takes a lot. It, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of concentration and is mentally exhausting sometimes, depending on how the night's going to really follow along with everything. Um, you know, I, and I tell anybody, if you ever get a chance to do it, absolutely get up, at, get up there and try to give it a shot and just see what it's about, because you'll figure out there's a lot more going on than you think. There's also stuff you have to come up with. You're filling dead air. There's I see. I think announcing is one of the hardest jobs because to be the lead announcer, not, especially if you don't have anyone with you, because you can't play off anything. Like yeah. I, I see that in my podcast when I have Ryan, I can play off Ryan, Ryan hand. But when I'm by myself on YouTube, it's more difficult because I'm speaking to the audience and I don't read a script despite what some people think. And I can imagine filling dead air, uh, coming up with catchy things to make it interesting for both people now at the, at the track and then people at home. That's a lot to ask of somebody. Well, announcing has become a lot more difficult because of streaming. I mean, back in the day before streaming, you gave the lineup, you talked a little bit under the caution about what was going on. And I, I saw many announcers, once the green dropped, they just put the mic down because they can't hear you. So why are you going to talk? So you weren't really an announcer. You were a color guy because you were just talking about under the caution. Well, you know, on lap five, this happened and this happened. But, you know, here's why we're under caution. And by the way, don't forget, we have French fries down at the concession stand. <laughs> we're now because of streaming, especially with me, where when I started, it was just audio. So you're it's theater of the mind you have to paint that picture that that's where i i kind of developed my style was i was doing an audio broadcast so you didn't have video to rely on to say well you know as you can see going into turn three you know the car is getting tied off the left rear and that's why he's crab walking up the track you had to describe you know so and so's going in on the bottom the car is going to wash out on him tied in the left rear he's almost to the wall you know and trying to paint that picture so streaming has made it a lot harder and that's something that again it's a give and take because i already don't like the sound of my own voice and i don't want to wear everybody out with the sound of my own voice so there's times where it's best just to turn the mic on and not say anything and there's times at the racetrack where it is horribly inappropriate to say anything so oh, yeah. you know that's where you know you try to have a soundtrack and you try to have plenty of music to fill time if needed um, one of the nice things about streaming now is we're able to pre-package interviews. I know Drake with USAC does a phenomenal job with that and going down and getting these, you know, two and a half, three minute interviews to fill some of that time. Because obviously we don't want to say we, we don't want to play the same commercial 50 million times because guess what? I get tired of watching them, too. So, you know, in, in the booth, sometimes it's it's a little tough. But one of the things we figured out at Ocala is they were able to send me a Google drive link to some of these interviews where when they're playing a commercial, I can play the audio from the video over the PA. And we did that with Zach Dom whenever we did the follow-up interview after he went over the fence, just to let everybody hear that. Yes, he, he's fine. He's good. So, you know, they're, we're always trying to come up with different ways to fill dead time. And the worst thing, in my opinion, is just constantly talk and drone. 
because eventually everybody's going to just turn around and start flipping you off going, would you please shut up? No, and I think that's a good point. When to talk and when not to prep. How much if you're doing a show, you got you have a show coming up this Saturday. It's a USAC show because you're now with USAC, which we'll get into then. Mm-hmm. How much prep goes into it? I'm like going into to Florida because there was so much that I didn't know about these drivers. It's one of those I've always followed the series and I've always followed the drivers, but I've never really followed them that closely. It's always just been kind of name number from town. You know, aside from guys like Brady Bacon, who was racing ASCS, like when I started, you know, I pretty much know his history kind of start to finish. But I, I took about a good week where I sat down and just started going through and social media stalking every driver I could find that I thought would be there and to try to get their sponsors beforehand, get some stats beforehand. And that's one thing with having Richie, where he was able to send me a lot of the USAC history. In fact, all the USAC history and to go through that and be able to pick up stats and figures and, and have some different stuff to talk about. Um, now that I've got a little bit of time off here in March, I'm actually doing a micro show at Fort with Talon Turner here next weekend. Surprisingly don't have anything this weekend. And then we start back up in April and in the middle of that, we'll have the midget season start up as well as silver crown. So you know, that's same thing. Silver Crown is going to be a totally new beast for me. So probably a good week to, if not more preparation, getting ready for that. The good thing about midgets, most of them were just at the chili bowl. So I have a database of nearly 400 drivers worth of information I can already pull off of. So the midgets is still going to be a lot of work, but on any given race night, once the season really gets going, I'm at least a day, day and a half in advance going through, making sure that I've updated my stats, updated notes and looking for anything that maybe they've raced elsewhere to try to throw that in and say, Hey, you know, they've got, you know, four wins with USAC this year, but they also went over and raced high limits and got a win there. They went over and raced at gas city. And by the way, they won two straight there. So you're with ASCS, but you're not just doing announcing you're doing marketing. You're doing, I know if I needed something with ASCS, you're the guy I call because it seems like you were a jack of all trades as well. I was uh-huh. doing what's that? I was doing all, all the PR, all yes. the press releases, video, audio, social, website. Um, I, I always kind of laughed and said basically what some series hired three or four people to do, you know, I was doing, and that's not to to say anything bad about anybody or say anything good about myself. It's just, that was the situation I was in. And I just kind of learned to deal with it to where even up until the last couple of years, inputting the lineups and results in the website, I was doing all that while I was doing lineups. And the good thing about with, we were using MRP is they made it very, very user-friendly to where I could do that. Yeah. My race pass does a great job. How difficult do you think that, took away from your announcing a little bit or did it add to it? Both. There were times where I felt like maybe I should have been saying or doing more, but at the same time it added to it because the stats and the figures and what was going on was so real time. And I was having to deal with it in the moment. So I was able to, to use that not only with the announcing, but whenever I would get done and I would have to do the press release what when you're your style how do you because you don't announce everything the same way how do you know because we see it online all the time the fans they're critical the fans are tough man (laughs) you know i thought they were tough on me sometimes about you know stuff i've written or they didn't agree i'll tell you what announcing especially now is tough because People are ruthless. How do you know what works, what doesn't? And if you went too far on something and you should have maybe downplayed something or, or, you know what I mean? A lot of it for me is gut feeling. Um, If I, if I feel like it needs to be hyped up or it needs, it needs to be a major thing, then as I, I look at it as a fan, if it's something that I feel like I would be interested in, then I'm going to maybe play on it a little bit more 
Um, and I go back to the advice I got from Alan when I first started. If it's exciting, be excited. If it's not, just let it play out. The fans can see what's going on and, and they'll call you on it. So you, there's no need to fabricate it. We're, we're not in, in WWE. We're not, you know, that this isn't a scripted sport. This is all happening in real time. So let the excitement come through as it is. Do you look at what fans say on social? That's something I learned a long time ago is stay out of the comments because a lot of times it's people that are not there. They're going off of secondhand information or they have an ax to grind. I, I, I've got plenty of haters and I got plenty of people that'll, that'll cheer me on too. The people that I worry about when I'm announcing are the ones that are paying me to be there. If they're happy, if the sponsors are happy, if the drivers are happy, then I know I'm doing my job correctly. But whatever Buffalo Bill Bob and Pasadena has to say, because <laughs> he happened to tune in for five minutes and didn't like the way I said something, I, I really don't care. That's not to say that I don't care about the fans. Obviously, yes, I care very much about the fans. I care about the fans that are sitting in the stands, paid money to be there, and are enjoying the show. I don't care about somebody that hides behind a screen name and just talks shit. Chili bowl. Here we go. You know it. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so when do you okay, when do you believe or what year do you believe that thing turned into a monster? I mean, not from the inception. Oh god. I mean, when it really went to this level of okay, it, this isn't just a midget race indoors in the middle of winter probably the early 2000s when you saw tony you know coming back from nascar you saw jj you know pull off the triple crown and, and his involvement that's i feel like when it really started taking off just looking at the numbers and, and looking at the coverage and everything you know then you got into you know the 2010, 2011, you know, we always kind of rode around that like 225, 250, Mark 225, and all of a sudden it just exploded and hit 300 entries, and it be just became a whole nother beast at that point. Streaming has really changed a lot in what we do. Social media has changed a lot in what we do and how we approach things because we we went from this regional audience to a national audience to now a worldwide audience. I mean, we have ticket holders in the U S Australia, Canada, the UK, Germany, France, New Zealand. I mean, it's, it's incredible how far we send tickets out. And when we're getting messages from people watching online that are, you know, legitimately they're sitting in the middle East watching the chili bowl. Or they're they're sitting in the UK or they're sitting in Ireland. They're I mean it it's incredible the reach that this event has now. So it's like every year I keep thinking there's no way it could get bigger and somehow it does. Now you do the thing at the you come out and do your thing at the beginning of the night and get people hyped up. Where did that come from? What what is your job at that point? And what do you think of when you see where this thing started and to where it is now and you see all those people up there and and just get this, we'll kind of whip them into a frenzy? It was off the cuff. The first time I did that was completely off the cuff. And it was, at that point, it. I don't just want to be tuned up all the time because that gets annoying. I don't want to be just so uh, because, you know, <laughs> then what's the point? You know, walk up there and go, well, I guess we're going to race. Like, All right, Eeyore, shut up. Let's go. <laughs> but there, there has to be a balance there. And I looked at it as I'm not talking at the fans. I'm talking to the fans because I would, I wouldn't want somebody basically just talking at me. I want them talking to me. And that's how I want to approach it is, I'm having a conversation and I want my passion for what I do and my love of this sport and my love of this event to come through. And 
we have to build the hype, but it doesn't need to be on kill from the word go. And, you know, the are you ready for the chili bowl and all that, that was just a, well, let's see if it works. And the first time I did it and the place just erupted, it just kind of, again, it's kind of like this, which saved your lunch money for. I figured out, okay, I can get away with this. And what year was that? When was the first time you did that? Do you remember? I actually didn't do that for, I think, till about 14. Because in 12 and 13, his first name is Mike and his last name escapes me right now. But he was he had done the infield forever. And he had been around even in the days of Jack Miller. And he he left, and then it was me, Tony, and Randy, and we were actually trading off who was going down to the infield each day. And Saturday, Emmett wanted me down there to to handle opening ceremonies and pray to states and everything. And um, I was nervous as all get out because at that point I'd never stood. You know, I stood in front of large crowds, but I'd never stood on that stage. And I just kind of winged it and, you know, went from there. And that's where I figured out that I, I wanted to, to convey emotion and respect and pay respect to the people that were there before me that kind of paved that way. You know, the, the Jack Millers, the, you know, and Tony and all the years that he'd been there and Randy Ward and the years that he'd been there and make sure that I was doing a service and doing a job that they could look at and say, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're proud of what you you said you were nervous. Do you still get nervous before oh, events? Absolutely. absolutely. Um, I, I guarantee you that first that first night in Ocala um, is probably about the most nervous I've been in a while. Just because it's it's a new series, it's a new set of drivers. You know, and, and I'd been to Ocala before and I've worked with Spridge and I've worked with Richie and, and, you know, I've done a couple races with them, but it's, it's different when you're just doing a one-off show versus this could potentially be what you're doing going forward. So I, I was, I was nervous, but once I got through qualifying and, and started in the heat races, you know, then it was like, you're just at a race, just do your thing. So USAC, you're now the guy at USAC. When you did that stuff in Florida, did you know that you'd be auditioning or was this a one-off like you say? And when, if, if it was a one-off originally, when did it become a, this might be my gig moving forward? No, it was the audition. Um, and, you know, when I talked to Spridge about it and, I, and I'm glad he did it that way because it gave me a chance to, to really work with everybody and, and get an idea and a better kind of grasp of what the series is about. And, you know, I, like I said, I'd done two shows with him to that point. One of them was a last second, hey, you're going to do this because it was at Lakeside for the sprint cars. Chet was not feeling good. His voice was starting to go away. And I went up just to, you know, say, hey, how's it going? And he looked at me, he goes, where are you going to be? So I guess anywhere you need me to be. He goes, well, I'm going to get through qualifying. He goes, you might be calling the rest of this show. And he got through qualifying, and I remember he just he was standing there and just went, wow, because he he knew if he had kept going, his voice would would have been gone for the next couple of days. And I don't know, you know, what was going on, but he had a he had a case of laryngitis going, so I ended up calling the rest of the night, and that was my first time working with Richie and Spridge, and then they called me the next year. I was supposed to do midgets at Red Dirt and Beloy. Red Dirt got rained out, so I did the show in Beloy, and had an absolute blast, um, you know, and wasn't sure what to expect whenever I walked in, but everybody was real, was more than welcoming, very friendly, you know, like, Hey, you know, what do you need? What can we do for you? So I already had that perception going into Florida, but it was nice to be able to really work with everybody and get a better idea of, of who, what, where, and when. And pretty much by the second night I was going, yeah, th this is what I want to do. Like th these, the whole organization was just great to work with was did you know you nailed it did you know you uh, was was there a point down there where you're like you know what they're gonna come to me i'm gonna get this gig not really um i went up to spridge and and basically said like i'm in like if if y'all are happy i'm in and he said all right so 
it it was actually after I'd said that and said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm in, like, just put my name on the line. I felt a lot more comfortable after that in what I was doing. And I, that's when I started just trying to have a little bit more fun with it. And that's, you know, that's the thing is, is I want to make it fun, but I also want to take my job very seriously. And, you know, that's, that's one thing is I'll, you know, I think me and Chet threw more one-liners than anybody in dirt track racing, but I don't think I could hold a candle to some of the one-liners Chet has. And he's, he's an absolute pro in what he does. So coming in after his run and trying to fill those shoes, um, my size 12 may not be big enough, but I'm going to give it hell. So you, you go down there with, with the, in, the intent of an audition. What made you kind of, go that route after being with ASCS so long? Was it just time to move on? Did you kind of have a crystal ball of what was coming up, which I'm, we'll get into a little bit in a, in, a, in a minute. What made you want to audition for USAC like that in Florida? When you get a message from Dr. Sullivan asking, hey, would you be interested? I feel like that's something you don't turn down. It okay. was... It was one of those I never I never thought somebody like an organization like USAC would come to me and say, hey, would you be interested? So when I when I got the message and and initially I was like, you know, I, I want to see what it's about. I want to I want to see what what they're offering. I want to see what it is. And, you know, if I feel comfortable with it, then, yeah, you know, I, I want to go give it a shot to to, to think that I had a crystal ball of what was going on. No, I had no idea what was getting ready to happen. Um, never even crossed my mind that what, what is happening was about to happen. So, you know, I, after I had a chance to talk, talk with Spridge and, and, and everything. And, and I, and I walked up to Terry at Chili Bowl. It was Wednesday night and told him like, Hey, you know, they, they've asked me if I'd be interested and I'm going to go to Florida. And, and Terry was very supportive. He goes, man, go, go get it. He goes, absolutely. He goes, anything you can do to better yourself. He goes, that's, you know, that's the point of this series. And that's, you know, that's, you need to go do it. So, you know, even the first night, I mean, he texts me and says, man, I'm really proud of you. I hope you do a great job. So, and at the time I didn't know what was about to happen. And that was, it was about uh, four days later when I heard what was starting to happen and all I could think was, holy crap. Cause I had no idea. So now you're at USAC, <clears throat> excuse me. And you see everything that's transpiring. Uh, how difficult is it for you? Because you were with ASCS for well, 2012 through 2023 what is it hard to see all this for you? Mm -hmm. Oh, very. Uh, it's it, quite frankly, it sucks. I mean, I, I hate to see what's going on because I'm, I'm watching this series that I was with for all these years, just get drugged through the mud, you know, and, and seeing what people are saying and, and the speculations and of course the, well, I heard, well, I know. And it's like, no, you don't know anything. You know, and I go back to and, until you read it from the series, there's no need to speculate. And I don't know what's going to happen with the series yet. I've, I can't speculate. I can't give my opinion on any of that. But it's tough to watch the, the drivers and the teams and everybody that I've been with for so many years have to, to go through this. Obviously, ASCS is close to your heart. And I talked to you off air yesterday and we were talking about the benefits of ASCS, which I did on my 90 at nine this morning, because I called you and was even a little, I, I don't want to say why save the series, but I was like, okay, world racing group. We know all the rumors and we all know that, that that's true. I mean, I know that's true and that they are looking at it, but you know, what benefit is it? And you actually pointed some things out to me that I used in my nine at nine. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, ASCS, I do. I now believe that it is still viable and 
where do you come out on all that? And uh, some of the things we talked about, it really has been a feeder division for high level 410 racing. It has. And, and you, you brought up a good point in, in what you're talking about in, in your 90 and nine and, and Shane Stewart's a great example where he went and ran some of the 410 stuff, came yep. back, rebuilt his program, rebuilt everything and went back out and had an incredible second act. Hall of Fame he, career. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, look at where Jason Johnson was heading before we, you know, unfortunately lost him. Yep. Uh, look at the rise of Landon Crawley. I mean, that's, it, growing up watching his dad race and the success that Tim had with ASCS, multi-time champion. And that was in the days of Gary Wright and Terry Gray and, you know, some of the toughest names in sprint car racing. You know, and now his chance to go and drive for Jason Sides, and that's another one. You know, where did Jason start? He started with ASCS. So there's been a lot of top-tier drivers that have made it into the world of outlaws and in racing at the upper echelons in general, that this is where they started. This is where they learned. And it gave them a place to learn how to race on the road, how to build a team, how to talk to sponsors, how to get sponsors. And, you know, here's another one for you. Brian Brown started with the warrior region. You know, that's one I didn't think of. And which that was, that was before it was ASCS. That was whenever it was winged outlaw warriors under Archie. But he still got his start in the 360 ranks, and he's won and done a lot with ASCS. Yeah. So, you know, Jason Martin, who won the championship last year, you know, he's been well, well known in in, in the in the regional aspects of racing. And he and he did 410 racing. He did some, you know, gum out stuff and he did a lot of that stuff back in the day. Well, this is really kind of catapulted him. And, you know, Matt Covington has been able to, to build and, and grow with ASCS in his career. Blake Hahn's another one now. We see him going and running 410s. And he's had some success in his first kind of foyer into the 410s. He's had some stumbles, but everybody will when you're making that transition. But it is a proving ground. And it's been a proven benefit. You know, and, and we can get into the discussion of, well, you know, the cost of racing and the cost of this and the cost of that. How fast do you want to go? How much do you want to spend? Look, I and every, I, uh, yeah, and and I every told rule, you yesterday that. Yeah. Every rule I have ever seen put in place to try and save money. There's there's always a way around it to spend money somewhere else. And and I and I gave you a timeline. They put wings on the cars. That was a safety move. Well, now the cars are glued to the track. The engines went crazy. So now the engines go nuts. Okay, well, we got to unhook the cars because the racing, it's just whoever has the, the biggest budget and horsepower, they're going to win. All right, so we're going to put flat wings, tiny wicker bills, and we're going to put a center block of a, of a tire on the car. Okay, so now we've unhooked the cars. Well, now shocks went from $150 a corner to $1,525 a corner. I mean, there it goes back to for, for every cause and effect, for every action, there's going to be a reaction. So, you know, that's we're never going to find that perfect balance in, in racing. It just the competitive nature that it is, there's you're always going to be looking for an edge and you're always going to pay enough to find that edge. Look, if you're worried about cost, get out of racing. That's just how I look at it now because no matter look at the 305s. Thirty thousand dollars nearly. Yeah. So so that that's the other argument. Well, the heads. It's all it's all the heads fault. <laughs> so explain to me why a race saver engine with a sealed head that you cannot do anything with and a valve spring with seat pressure comparable to a ballpoint pen is almost thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> I know. Again, I mean, it's, and, and you have to understand, I was a car owner at one point in my life. Me, my brother, and my parents all paid to race. So, yeah, I, I understand it costs money. And we had our engines built locally. In fact, it was uh, John Carney II was our driver when we were in the late stages of our racing career. And his dad was the one building the engines. And we were building race saver engines with the nicest parts you could possibly throw at it. 
and we're spending 12,000 maybe mm -hmm. with the cost of building the engine. And granted, yeah, this was a few years ago, but if somebody came to me and said, hey, this budget engine that is sealed and you can't do anything with and has a crank that weighs as much as a boat anchor is going to cost almost as much as a, an ASCS engine that is competitive, very competitive on the regional level. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's cost. I chuckle at cost because it's like you said, no matter what, people are going to spend money. Owners are going to spend money. If the driver owns a car, he's going to spend money because they're going to look down the pit area and there's, oh, look what that guy has. I got to get it. And you have to understand, this isn't racing in the 80s. No. Everybody has access to everything. Yep. You, everybody has the same brakes. They have the same. So the the days of ingenuity in, in some ways, I feel, are kind of gone. You know, the things that made Carl Kinzer great, that made Leonard McCarl great, you know, that made these pioneers of the sport what they are. You know, it's... I don't know if we'll ever see that kind of ingenuity again outside of a complete redesign of the cars. I don't think you're going to do that because if you're going to, if, you're, if we are going to talk cost and it's much like I brought up this morning, let's say world racing group wants to make ASCS three sixties. Well, all those guys are going to have to absorb the cost of switching over. And I just don't think we're going to see that countrywide in the four ten division to just revamp everything. So I, I don't think that, I think once ingenuity was taken out of the equation, you cost then became what it's going to be. I mean, and, and it's not a slap at the sport and it's not a slap at a series or a director nope. or anybody. It's just, it's just the, the way things have progressed. And we have to have a, a, a rules package that keeps everybody competitive with each other. And you don't have anybody that can literally just out dollar everybody. Correct. And but within that, though, you're still going to have the advantage of cubic dollars versus versus cubic inches. Yeah, I couldn't say it any better. I mean, it's, because the alternative is. Somebody. Out dollaring somebody and then the teams that are spending money don't earn any money The yeah. it, the balance gets out of whack too much. Well, how, how many in all, all the years we've been doing this, how many times have you seen somebody come in that has a dump truck full of cash and within three years you don't ever see him again many many times you know and, and it's all a balance yeah and we can talk about costs and everything till until the cows come home racing is a balance it's a balance of the cost it's a balance of who's in the car who's setting up the car how you're getting down the road everything that goes into it you know you look at the guys that are that are just double bad throw down fast there's balance in the whole thing from the setup of the car. You notice they're not twitching. They're not, you know, the car's not radical. It's not doing crazy things. They hardly ever move inside the car unless they have to, because there's balance. So your balance on the track, who's driving the car, who's setting up the car, everything has to work together. And that coincides with the cost of your operation and everything that you're putting into it. Yes. And I will make the argument that if you look at the top five teams, I would say probably and I'm guessing here four of them aren't the high, four of those teams aren't the highest spending teams. No, you know, we, we had a lot of success in racing when my family was car owners, we won a lot of championships, won a lot of races. We did a lot of it on some very used equipment. Yep. It's the combination shifting gears. Okay. And you're announcing hat. I say it's very, very hard to go from pit reporting to being up top and calling a race. Chase Rodman is doing this now with high limit. I'm sure you've seen, you know, comments, this and that, you know, and I'm sure you've seen the races. How difficult is that to get used to when you've done that pit reporting slash infield reporting for a long extended period of time, and then you're asked to go to the booth? It, it took me a couple of years to get used to it because I'm used, you're so used to having the freedom to go 
and and find information and get information and talk to the drivers throughout the night versus now you have to get all of that before you ever even get to the booth and you have to section that out and use that information throughout the night. So it is tough. And, you know, I think Chase is doing a great job with it. I, I think he's, he's just going to get better and better. And, you know, I'm not going to comment on his style or anything like that. Cause that's not my place. Um, no, 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 you know, no. Have, but the, the, to actually do it, I think is very difficult though. It is. It, to me, it's easier to go from the top to the infield than it is from the infield to the top. Um, and that's one thing, because that's where I started. Anytime I get a chance to be a trackside reporter, absolutely. I love doing it. <laughs> I, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah. you know, like a couple years ago, working at Port, Chet and Haas were on the call up top, and I was doing trackside. I had a blast. You know, because at that point, I I get to actually watch the race, and I get to kind of play around with how do I want to ask this question or you know, do I want to ask about this or ask about that? And, you know, kind of playing on my knowledge of the cars and, and setups, being able to look at them and go, Hey, you know, look like the car was kind of picking up on the right rear a little bit. Were you fighting, fighting it being tight in the middle of the turn and seeing if, was I reading the car correctly? So it, it turns into a little bit of a challenge for me to, to figure out, am I really seeing what I think I'm seeing? We only have a couple minutes and I, and it's been a blur. I could have you on for two hours, <laughs> but I, I mean, you know, and, and I, and I'll get, you know, you know, if you come to Tulsa in January, you'd have like a whole week. Yeah. I, I, I know <laughs> <laughs> I figured that was coming. I can't get into midgets. I just can't. I, you're, you're, how about, you're, how about micros? No. Oh God. No. I'm going to see micros at uh, Lincoln Speedway this weekend. See what's wrong with that though. I can't, I can't. I'm a the big, shootout, the shootout, in my opinion, is a tougher and better race than the Chili Bowl. Okay, we're going to clear this up right now. <laughs> there is a chance, okay, and I say a chance that I go to the Chili Bowl because you have sprint car drivers in it. I'm in you know, a we, 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 we have We have a couple that you might even know. <laughs> no, there's a lot of them I know. But <laughs> I become this elite. I'm a sprint car snob. I, I, I see, see, and that's where I love a good modified race. I love a good sprint car race and never, never, ever sleep on the local street stock division. Well, you know, it's funny you say that as much as I'm in a, a and people kind of, cause this has come up eh, probably in the last year. I started with Northeast modified racing for the first races I saw at five years old, which just tells you how old I am. And that was back in 1977 uh, at Penn National Speedway. And then it was Super Sportsman. I didn't see a sprint car until I, in 1984. So, no, I do appreciate other forms of racing. I've watched And it is a life-changing experience. <laughs> okay. <laughs> life-changing is extreme. At, I'm 52. I think my life has changed enough. <laughs> But no, I, I do appreciate other forms of racing. Uh, and yes, I'll watch a good street stock bomber race anytime. You just can't beat it. But the chili, look, you might get me to the chili bowl. Ryan Hand, my, my co host on the podcast, kind of feels the way I do, but he went last, uh, not this past season, the season before. Now he left Wednesday, though. That's what he didn't tell anybody. He went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then left. Twitter. Yeah, he's a quitter. <laughs> but I, there's a chance, I'd say probably a bigger chance than ever, that I would go to that event. Now, I don't think I'm local weather, man. I don't think there's, a, there's a chance. You know? Yeah, I don't think I'm going all <laughs> week. <laughs> I don't know about that. Come on. Come on. But so you sat. You're with you, Zach. Is this an end game for you? Or do you, I mean, let's face it. You never thought ASCS would come calling. You never thought USAC would come calling. And if somebody else comes calling, which you probably don't even fathom, you're kind of a humble guy. Um, what, I mean, is this the end game for you? As you see it right now, as you sit there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As long as the people I'm with 
take care of me. And as long as the people that I'm working with are true to their word, it, it would take a lot to get me to, to go somewhere else. And it, you know, this, I'm just long for the ride. That's, that's really the best way to put it. It, uh, you know, I, if somebody were to call, it'd have to be a hell of an offer, but to get the opportunity to do what I'm doing, I feel like it would be a disservice and disrespectful to, to say, oh yeah, well, somebody else called because then that just puts doubt into what I'm doing. But I'm right now I'm along for the ride and it's a hell of a ride. I've always talked to you in the pit area. I talk to you a lot at Knoxville when I go out and you, to me feel it's and it's pretty genuine you're pretty genuine you almost feel like the luckiest guy in the pit area i get that sense every time i oh. talk to you you feel genuinely lucky to be because and i tell people this to be an announcer you gotta you gotta have passion for the sport you gotta be a fan first it's not you can't just start out as a job uh you know i i started it started as a hobby and i i haven't found another hobby to replace it it's <laughs> I guarantee you, I, I feel like I'm lucky as hell to even be doing this. So let's say I never even, and not to be morbid or dark, I never thought I was going to live to see 21, much less see 38 and be doing what I'm doing to be able to take something that I, I really had a passion for and really enjoyed and turn it into a profession and to be doing it on a national scale is just there, there's so many times where I, I walk into the booth and I have to pinch myself and go, yeah, you're really doing this. You're, you are literally being paid to be a race fan. Like it's, 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 it's the greatest thing ever. And it's, I, I couldn't thank enough people enough times for taking a chance to, to have me do this. You know, it started with Holly and her dad, Royal. You know, Sherman Barnett and, and Alan Moore and his words of encouragement, my dad taking me all over the country to, to watch racing and be a part of racing. You know, Emmett and Fuzzy, when they took a chance on me and, you know, now with with USAC, Spridge and, and Pat and Richie and everybody. There, there's no way I could say thanks enough times. Well, Brian, I appreciate you coming on the deep dive. I've wanted to get you on something long form like this, this platform allowed me to do that i think you do a great job i think usac's getting a good announcer and, a, and a, a person who you know has passion for the sport uh, i've known you a while now and uh again i'll be calling you for now usac information and not ascs information yeah. we've changed acronyms <laughs> yes yes that's that's but exactly i will finally make it back to pennsylvania that is a good point I didn't even think of that. Yes, Eastern Storm in June. I'm so excited. I got to get back and terrorize Kathy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to leave it go on that note. Brian, again, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. That's going to wrap up the SprintCarLimited.com deep dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. Thanks again to Brian Holbert for joining the show. It was good stuff. And don't forget to click that subscribe button on our YouTube channel and check out our daily exclusive content at www.sprintcarunlimited.com. And we'll be back next Thursday with another guest. Stay tuned.